Uh, good morning and welcome to the Navigator's Bible class. We are currently uh, in the study of Matthew 13, the parables of the kingdom. Matthew 13, the parables of the kingdom. So guess where we need to turn to in our scriptures? Matthew 13. <laughs> Last week we um, uh, introduced uh, this subject. We did. That was the first one, wasn't it? Uh, the introduction of this class. And uh, here's some of the things we uh, talked about last week that these uh, parables require careful study because they can be misunderstood, uh, misapplied, and things like that. Uh, many have done so. Uh, also, the subject of the parables, and Jesus announced this in the chapter, are, is the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven. Now, what the kingdom of heaven is, it's this over here, the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ on this earth. It is political, it is physical, it is earthly, <clears throat> it is here on this earth, and he will take the place of all kingdoms and governments that have gone before him and he will be uh, king of kings and lord of lords on this earth. That is the subject of the parables. He's talking about the kingdom of heaven. And basically we looked at the history preceding what uh, uh, where Jesus talked about the parables, what happened before he started uh, using parables. Uh, we had John the Baptist preaching. We have it on our timeline right here. And uh, he preached that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That the kingdom of heaven was at hand. Which meant the king was close by. And Jesus was. That was the message. And uh, he also baptized Jesus. Uh, then Jesus began preaching, and he preached the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But he also preached about the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God involves righteousness, getting right with God, see, a thing of the heart, a spiritual thing, Whereas the kingdom of heaven is a physical thing. Uh, and so he preached both of these messages. Now, um, if they, John and Jesus, had come preaching uh, to Israel, say, hey, we got to get together and we got to overthrow these Romans and take back our our country, uh, he would have been well received. Uh, and there were many that had done that in the past. However, they both came preaching, you're going to have to get right with God. You're going to have to uh, deal with your sin. And this was not a particularly hmm, popular message. Now they came out to hear him preach. They came out to see what was happening. They came out to get the bread and the and the goods that he distributed. They, yes, Jim. Yeah, could, could John have known that the Jews would reject Jesus? Uh, no. He just he just came preaching that the kingdom of heaven was at hand. I don't think he uh, understood that. Uh, good point. Now. John was put in prison, and later he was beheaded. Jesus began to be rejected mainly by the officials, the, the scribes, the Pharisees, the elders, the rulers of Israel, the leaders rejected him, and some of the people did also. And you remember that he said that 
if I had a preached in Sodom and Gomorrah instead of Capernaum, Sodom and Gomorrah would have repented long ago. But you didn't. And you had all this preaching. Okay? So he began speaking in parables. He quit putting it right out there in black and white. And he started preaching in parables. So this is the history of that. Now, we also have our timeline for this series. I wanted to explain that. Uh, in times past, we have a timeline that has everything in it, right? All the little events, as many as we can put on the board. We're just going to work with kind of a bare timeline. We've got the, John the Baptist and Jesus over here. We've got the kingdom of heaven over here. And while we started with John the Baptist, we're going to end up with the kingdom of heaven, the rule of Christ. And so what we have in the middle will be details that are given in the parables. We'll be put those, putting those in there. Now, picking up from last week, let's go to Matthew chapter 13 and read the first three verses. <clears throat> it says, The same day Jesus uh, went Jesus out of the house and sat by the seaside. The great multitudes were gathered together unto them so that he went into a ship and sat. And the whole multitude stood on the shore and he spake many things unto them in parables. It's uh, interesting that uh, they come out and they're sitting on the shore and he's in a boat speaking to them. And uh, why do you think he was in a boat? Something's wrong. Pretty sound. That's it. Sound carries over the water. If you are a boater, in my case I was a sailor so I don't have that loud engine running, uh, you can hear people talking in their boat hundreds of yards away and clearly hear what they're saying. I don't think they know that. <laughs> yes, sir? Before we get started, can you explain to me why Jesus talked in parables? Because nobody could understand what he was saying anyway. Yes, sir. Uh, we're going to do that on the next slide. <laughs> Okay? I was looking for the other slide. I was you, you were already, yeah. <laughs> Tim's one, kind of one step ahead of me, but that's good. That's good. Uh, <clears throat> but he, yeah, he, he got in the boat because from the boat, his voice would carry and he could be heard uh, over a wide area. I just thought that was interesting. No big theological thing there, but... Maybe it, you want to get that here. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, fortunately, we have technology. Yeah, yeah, I can talk into the microphone. And so, <laughs> uh, they didn't have PA systems back then. And uh, even though uh, sometimes our PA system goes awry over <laughs> in the auditorium... Uh, at least, well, we're not having to get out in a boat, so. And, okay, anyway, so this is what we have sort of for an introduction. Jesus begins to speak in parables, and the question is, why? Now, the disciples ask why he was doing so, and we can ask too, as Tim already has. Uh, look at, at verse 10. The disciples came and said unto him, why speakest thou unto them in parables? He says, you've been, you've been setting it out word for word up to this point. Why are you now speaking in parables? And by parables, we understand that he is not coming out and saying uh, specific things as much as he is kind of using allegories and stuff like that. We'll be talking about it. In, but it's not direct, see? And they're wondering why Jesus gives two reasons. Actually, he only gives one reason. But there are two reasons why 
Jesus spoke in parables. The first reason he shares that, he answers their question. Look at verse 11 through 13. He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. Whoa. For whosoever hath to him it shall be given, he that and he shall have more abundance, but whosoever hath not from him it shall be taken away, even that he hath. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And he kind of says this again over in verse 34 and 35. Uh, in verse 34, uh, all these things spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables, and without a parable spake he not unto them, the multitudes. Verse 35, that it may be fulfilled, might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. So this is a hint coming to you as to why he's speaking in parables. Uh, uh, he, he's talking about things that have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. He's only explaining this to his disciples. Now that brings up a, uh, a couple of things. The first thing, it was to fulfill prophecy. In Isaiah 6, 9 and 10, that's almost an identical quote from verse uh, 30, 35. That uh, he would open his mouth in parables, and seeing they see not, hearing they hear not. That's a quote from Isaiah 6. 9 and 10. So he's actually fulfilling prophecy here by speaking in parables. God knew ahead that, he would, that this was part of his plan. That he was going to speak in parables. Which is why he told Isaiah some 600 years or a little more before this event that he was going to do that. Alright. Uh, notice, it was God's will and part of God's plan that Christ would be rejected. Isaiah 53 verse 10 taught that Isaiah 53 is the uh, story of Christ on the cross. That's where it has that, uh, I believe it's verse 6 that says, He was bruised uh, he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. Uh, and it goes into his suffering and uh, for our sins. But verse 10 says, It pleased the Lord to bruise him. In other words, it was in God's plan that Christ would suffer. It was in God's plan that Jesus would have to die for the sins of the world. Now he knew this. Before he created anything, God knew this. Yes, sir? Still, he's preaching to thousands and thousands. But they don't understand what the heck he's saying. So why would they keep on following him if they don't understand what he's saying? <coughs> Well, um, curiosity. Yeah, uh, curiosity is one thing. They want to see the miracles. They want to see the healings. Uh, many people came to him to be healed. Uh, the signs of the kingdom, you see, were there. And they were looking at the signs and the wonders and the miracles and the free food. Hello? Uh, you know, and 
and they were maybe more interested in the um, um, what's the word you know all those uh, things uh, than they were the message that he had because eventually they said crucify him you see um, anyway uh, we in this see the sovereignty of God the sovereignty of God uh, that is a doctrine that says God made everything therefore he can do with it what he wants to do simple as that if you've got a carpenter he's got a pile of wood and nails and glue and saws and everything he can take that material and make out of it what he wants to make why because he is the craftsman God made this world he made everything that exists John 1 says without him was not anything made that was made and by right of creator he can do anything he wants to do with it and what uh, position do we have to say you shouldn't have done that you know why, can, why must we question God by what he does when by all evidence we owe our lives our existence to him now Romans 9 18 says that I will have mercy God is speaking I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy and I will harden whom I will harden uh, we don't understand from our standpoint, from human standpoint, all that the sovereignty of God involves. That's one of those things that we'll understand better by and by. Our responsibility is to say, God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. I may understand it as the Lord opens to me these things through the Holy Spirit. But for right now, I'm going to accept it and wait for God to show me then what it means. But he said it, so I'll believe it. Now, the first reason that Jesus spoke in parables was it was prophesied that he would. And it was prophesied that they would... It was done so, so they would not understand clearly. That they would not see clearly everything. He did cut the disciples in on it. He said, this is what it means. See? But he didn't explain that to the multitudes. Here, even though Jesus didn't explain this reason, he did so as he quoted it in um, verse 35, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, I will open my mouth in parables, I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. Now back in verse 11, he refers to the information that he is giving out in the parables as mysteries secrets, mysteries. Now what is a mystery as uh, in the Bible? What is it that the Bible refers to as a mystery? Something that what? Something that is secret, something that has never been explained before or something that has not been mentioned before. You remember the Apostle Paul referred to a number of things that he was explaining in his scriptures as mysteries. Like the mystery of the church. The mystery that Jews and Gentiles will become one in the body of Christ. Those who believed in Christ, see, would be members of his body. Uh, the rapture was a mystery. Uh... Paul says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. In other words, there'll be some of us here that aren't going to die. 
And I believe some of us in this room here will not die till Christ comes to take us away. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare it, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Okay? That was something that he told the disciples, but not the multitude. And then Paul explained it in his epistles later. So, the subject matter of the parables is another reason uh, 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 why he spoke that way. The subject matter is this. He was getting into subjects that God would not reveal until Paul wrote it in his epistles years later. Do you see? He told the disciples. But he didn't reveal it to the people because it wasn't time to reveal it. He was going to reveal it through Paul in the scriptures that would come a few years after he was gone. The subject matter. Okay, the parables are called mysteries, something that was not previously revealed. Now, the subjects of these that aren't revealed describe the years between his first coming okay, and his second coming. This is the context of the parables. He's describing things that are going to be happening in here. Because he says, the kingdom of heaven is like this. Da, 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 da. And describes in parables what's going on or what will go on in here. Okay. Now that is a clue to understanding basically what the parables are all about. These, par <laughs> here we go. These parables were hints or clues about things to come that were not mentioned in the Old Testament. Old Testament days over here. Jesus begins to give hints and clues about this. And then Paul later talks about some of those things plainly as he writes. The parables of the kingdom of heaven contain descriptions of times and events leading up to the kingdom of heaven. In other words, these things, it's going to be like this until the kingdom of heaven. It's going to be like that until the kingdom of heaven. In other words, it will be like that until I come back. When I come back uh, is, is going to be uh, the day of the Lord. Okay. Getting into the parables. Uh, Jesus explained two of the parables to his disciples. I didn't see any other explanations of any other parables. But he gave the first parable and explained it. Then he gave the second parable and explained it to the disciples, not to the multitude. And I think after he did that, they kind of got the hint as to what was going on because later he said in verse 51, do you understand all this stuff I'm telling you? After he had already given out seven of the parables, and they say, yeah, we get it. We get it. Um, so it's for us to uh, understand that they got the other five parables as well because he explained the first two. Then when he gave out the other parables, they understood the context. Uh, we mentioned this earlier. Understanding of scriptures is only given by God to those who accept them, who accept the words from God. Then he shows you what they mean. 
Somebody says, well, how can I accept something if I don't know what it means? Well, I hate to tell you, but none of us understood the Word of God at all until God showed us. When we accepted Christ as our Savior, the Holy Spirit became, uh, uh, we became the temple of the Holy Spirit. It's where He dwelt in us. Uh, 1 John chapter 2 says he's the teacher that resides in you. And he's the one that teaches you this stuff. And Jesus said, when I go away, I will send the Comforter, the Holy Spirit. He will teach you things to come. He will guide you into all truth. So no understanding of scriptures comes without the Holy Spirit explaining it to you. But he is not going to explain anything to you if you say, well, I don't believe that. And he said, okay. You just stay right there until you decide you believe it. It's like a hurdle. You know these uh, uh, track things where they set the hurdles up and, you know, the guys go on, they, they, they're running real fast and then they come to a hurdle. They got to jump over it. They do this in horse uh, and equestrian stuff too. They got this thing they got to jump over. Well, if they stop, they can't go any further in the course until they jump over it. Then they can go on. That's the way God is with us. When we come to a place in Scripture that, oh wow, that's uh, I don't, I don't get that. How many of you have ever done that? Come to place in Scripture, well, I don't get that. <laughs> I do. Uh, and you got one or two things. You're going to say, well, I, I'm not, I, I'm, I can't accept that. You know what happens? You stand behind that hurdle until you do accept it. And then when you do accept it, on the other side of the hurdle, God begins to show you what it meant. Okay. Speaking of multitude, it is possible that the multitude was only told the first four parables. It could be that the second or the last three parables were only told to the disciples. I'm not quite sure of this, but it seems like that that he was talking to the multitude and then kind of turned to the disciples only and and told them the last three not sure of that but this is a possibility if you look at verse 36 in Matthew 13 uh, it says Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house and his disciples came unto us saying Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. That's the second one. And he, and then he went on and told them about that. And then in verse 44, uh, um, he, he goes into the fifth one. See, he's already told four parables to the multitude. But the fifth one and the sixth one and the seventh one, he may have only told the disciples after the multitude went away. So that kind of sets you up for the, um, the details uh, of these parables. Uh, here's a list of them. Uh, you, you might want to jot this down or wait till the notes come out, email or what. It will be in them. The list of the parables is this. The first one is the parable of the sower in verses 3 through 8. The second one is the parable of the wheat and the tares, 24 through 30. Then we have the grain of mustard seed, which is a real, and all these are interesting, actually, when you get into them, they, they, they're, they're, they're really kind of neat. Uh, uh, the grain of mustard seed, verse 31 and 32. The fourth one is about the leaven, the leaven, that's yeast that's put into the bread, you know, to make it rise. Only gets one verse, verse 33. 
long parable, right? Okay. <laughs> uh, the fifth one is hidden treasure. A treasure hidden in a field. It only gets one verse. Uh, the number six is the pearl of great price. We've all heard sermons about the pearl of great price, have we not? It's it's kind of a it's kind of a, a, a neat parable, verse forty five and forty six, and then and then uh, the seventh one, uh, Schofield calls it the dragnet. That's the the net that catches all these fish, and you know some are good fish, some are bad fish, whatever. Uh, but uh, that is uh, referred to as the dragnet in forty seven and forty eight. Now. There are some who say that there is an eighth parable, parable number eight. Uh, we'll look at it. I'm not sure if it uh, qualifies totally as a parable, but I will list it for you here just uh, to kind of cover all the bases, so to speak. So if there is an eighth one, the eighth one would be, and I got a little question mark by it, the, the householder. The householder. Uh, now the householder is mentioned in another one of the parables um, earlier, but um, it, may, it may or may not be of the same context. And that's in verse 52. That's after he's um, asked the disciples if they understood all this. Uh, then he goes into the what might be the eighth one. So uh, this is the list of parables, and they kind of kind of fit neatly. What we're going to do is try to get one, maybe two a week, maybe three. I don't know how fast we're going to go, but I'm going to have notes a way ahead. So we'll go, and at a quarter after, we'll say, okay, that's it. Tune in next week, you know, and we'll pick up from there. But uh, that is the order that we'll take these parables. Uh, keep in mind that all of these parables talk about the times and the events, what things are like leading up to the big event. The big event is the day of the Lord, when he returns to set up his throne. Ninety percent of all prophecy speaks of this event. So, that gives you the context. There are certain rules, uh, and Jesus didn't write these rules, but as we have studied them, we observe certain things about parables. Uh, we've already mentioned one of them is that you don't base doctrine on parables. You use parables to kind of reinforce doctrine, you see. If somebody goes to the parables and tries to make a major doctrine out of it, that's when you can kind of get into errors and stuff. So parables reinforce truth, not declare it per se. Uh, here, here are kind of the rules. They are simple. Uh, this is not rocket science, so to speak. Uh, they're simple. There's stories that everyone can identify with, settings that everyone understood, and the people that are uh, in the parables that are described are, are, are situations to which everyone can relate. Uh, they are fictitious. They don't use proper names. They don't refer to individuals by name. If Jesus is talking and he is mentions somebody by name, it is not a parable. Uh, just an example of that is Luke, uh, was it 16, where you have, uh, he relates a story about 
the rich man and Lazarus. Lazarus was a beggar. Well, that was not a parable. That was a true event. We know because Lazarus is mentioned by name, Abraham is mentioned by name, and so uh, that would not be a parable, but the parables are fictitious. They don't use names. What do they say? The names are changed to protect the innocent. They, you know, some of these uh, uh, police shows or something. Uh, <clears throat> They use examples in everyday life. We, we mentioned that before. They usually have a single main point. They're not trying to use the shotgun approach where you cover a whole lot of different subjects. They're kind of a rifle where they're zeroing in on one main idea. That is per parable, obviously. Uh, Jesus also declares them to be a parable. He said, this is a parable. Here it goes. Bingo. Uh, no doubt about it. The sixth one, oh, I said this before. It's not rocket science <laughs> to recognize that they are indeed parables. You know they are, not only because Jesus said they were, but uh, you recognize them as, as, as such. But number seven, they are important. Let me say, well, if they're stories, they're just parables, and we don't really need to fool with it. Uh, you know, you can, you know, that's nice and all, but but they are important because Jesus spent time with these parables. And uh, they are all in this context here. Now there are certain what we call parenthetical passages within Matthew 13. In other words, he, tell, he tells a parable and then there's kind of a parenthesis of stuff where, you know, he's telling the multitude this, and then he goes over to the side, and by the way, you know, da 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 The parenthetical section, there are uh, several. First of all is the introduction. Uh, one through three is kind of, it's not really parenthetical, it's an introduction. We've already done that one. And uh, verses 9 through 17, he tells the disciples his reasons for speaking in parables in there. That's not given to the multitude. And in verses 51 through 52, he gives a conclusion. And that's where that eighth parable, if you want to place it in this context, would come. That's his conclusion. And the disciples, according to their own words, understood that Jesus was talking about things and conditions and qualities of the times approaching his return and his setting up of his throne on earth. Does anybody have any questions so far? Do yes. you think that they actually was able to conceptualize the fact that what you just said, were they actually... Did they really know that they applied to that time frame? They understood that this is, this is their vision of their timeline. This is where the disciples were, and they all they saw was, oh, that's, that's nice, there's all kinds of stuff going on there, and then boom. See? At this point, they didn't know about the rapture. At this point, they didn't know about the church. They just knew qualities of things that would, it would be like during this time. Paul made the final clarification and the details of what Jesus introduced here. Yes, sir. I see hand. Yeah. <clears throat> Might be a little bit off, but my question is, did the disciples actually understand and believe everything that Jesus taught? If they did, they wouldn't have been 
into the situation when he was crucified. And my mind is, when he came, returned to him after the crucifixion, that 40 days, he talked to them more in that 40 days, or they understood more in that 40 days than they did in the three years that he, they were with him. Uh, Okay, there's about ten parts to that. <laughs> uh, let me try to summarize it. They understood the generalities of what he was teaching in the parables. And as he began to educate them during the next, what, three years that they went around with him, they understood more and more. Uh, it did that he was taught or they were taught that he would die and be raised after three days he, he was clear with that but sometimes have you ever been told something and yeah it's a fact but it doesn't get through your thick head you know so to speak I think that was I think the disciples are saying well you know I, I think it was they yeah they believed what he said but they didn't want to uh, uh, referring to his death but I think after his resurrection click the lights came on yes when they got the tongues of fire didn't they get their, their wisdom uh, you, you're talking about at Pentecost uh, Acts 2 yeah, I think the Holy Spirit cleared up a lot of stuff then and motivated them to go out and do what Jesus had already told them to do. That is going to all the world. Yeah. From Jerusalem, for Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. So that's where they got their knowledge and their wisdom and everything else to understand all the stuff in the past. Yes, okay. All righty. Uh, how much time we have? We don't. <laughs> unless, unless we have the three minutes that Mr. Tim said that the clock is fast. Uh, next week we will get into the parable of the sower, which is the first parable. Dance. When, um, when if, if we were all to be sucked up now, we wouldn't die. We'd be Going. You're talking about the rapture, right? Yes. And then we come back to fight with Jesus at, at Armageddon at the end when he blows That's away. There. Yeah. Uh, the rapture is not clear in Scripture until Paul reveals it. Are, are we going to have to die again? No. Uh, the Old Testament type of, of us if we are the generation of believers that are alive when Christ calls us out the Old Testament type of that would be Enoch remember Enoch was caught up that he should die not die so somebody said well everybody's got to die because there's a point in the man that wants to die yes that is the appointment but for a whole generation of believers that are alive will not die. And Enoch is the Old Testament type of that. Well, when, when the two come back as witnesses and they come back that were taken up before, are, are they going to have to suffer and die then? when they come back at... at uh, um, we're getting into a little bit more information than we have time for this morning. Uh, but, uh, yeah, there's a... Uh, didn't we have a question and answer session a couple of weeks ago? We may have uh, have another one. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, man is evil, but didn't God create us with an innate spiritual hunger? Could that be why some of the people came to see him even if they didn't know why? That's possible. Something's missing. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for the time that you give to us. Time that we can come here and fellowship, to be with each other.
to share our things together, and Lord, to study your word. We pray that we would continue to have this time together until you come back to take us with you. Lord, we pray that you would guide in the service following in Jesus' name. Amen.